Conscious Entrepreneurs. I'm Sajda, Wendy Muhammad, and you are tuned in to the hottest show on IG Live. It's the Mo Today series on Black Muslim businesses. And we're going to talk today about doing for self, but we're going to have a Q&A. And I got some questions here. We're going to wait for everybody to get in the room. Tanetta Muhammad 7, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Alifa Jenna. Assalamu alaikum. Slate Stone Music. Thank you, dear brother. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Lamont, Brother Jamil. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to go through these questions today. And um, I'm going to show out a little bit. Y'all see my commemorative Elijah Coin pendant? Hope y'all check this out. Let me get it shined up a little bit. Nubia La Flo. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Welcome, welcome. That's you, Brother Jamil, texting me. <laughs> um, did y'all get y'all pendant? There's a link in the bio, okay, so that you can get your pendant and support the renovation and the restoration of the former home of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Jesus piece. That's right. And the front, has got the front of the coin. This copper, let me turn my music off so y'all can hear me clearly. This copper was made from the copper that we took down from the home of the Lamb of God. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all better, y'all better rush to get these because it's limited edition. Okay. And the link is in the bio. I see my brother Juan Carlo has stuck it here. Thank you. Y'all better come on. Um, no more discount code. Just get them. I priced it. I, I looked at the cost and I didn't price it what it should be because to me, it's such a blessing to be wearing a piece of the Christ home around my neck. So get your commemorative Elijah coin. If you can't remember the website, click the link in the bio and get it while supplies last because they ain't going to be around that long. So welcome, welcome everyone. Come on in. Um, hey mom, assalamu alaikum. So um, I want to make sure you all, um, Kevin, brother Kevin, thank you for joining. Um, make sure tomorrow that y'all are ready for the manifestation series. We're going to talk about learning to trust your gut. We're going to do it in a different kind of way. We're going to combine um, just kind of my style of teaching. If you guys have been around Follow me since 2009. You kind of just know um, how, I, how I roll. Um, we're going to do that tomorrow night. The idea is for us to just continue to keep making progress and walk those goals down. Play by play, strategy by strategy, micro goal by micro goal. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Um, so anyway, I talked about my commemorative Elijah coin, my Jesus piece. Um, this that I'm wearing is from Nana Wax in Katanu Benin. And I got this right before the pandemic when I was there. Um, I'm having an Africa itch because if you know me, I would have been there three or four times by now were it not for this pandemic and all the other things that I have going on. But we'll get back to the motherland soon. But anyway, shout out to Nana Wax um, in Katanu Benin for her incredible design. So today is Q&A. And we're going to be answering some questions that you all have sent in to me. Um, I'm going to start with the first one. Someone says, it is difficult for me to connect my spirituality with my work because it seems taboo in my workplace. And I think a lot of us know this reality all too well that... Um, Spirituality in the workplace, in a sense, is taboo. But you know what? You don't have to wear it on your sleeve. You are who you are. Your spirituality, how you express what is sacred to you, it oozes out in how you do things, how you handle things. You don't have to preach in the bathroom. You don't have to go in the break room and get you a soapbox and a little amp and start talking about Jesus. <laughs> You don't have to stand outside and sell final calls in front of your job. But the way you carry yourself, how you conduct yourself, what you value and what is sacred to you, your integrity, your word, 
how you handle your business, how you do things. Those are all part of your spirituality. So the idea is to make your spirituality a way of life. Don't wait for somebody to give you a chance to get on your soapbox. That's none of their business. That's the beautiful thing. They made it taboo, fine, so we don't gotta talk about it. But you believe what you believe and you conduct yourself in a way so that in the event someone ever says, oh, this is his religion or this is her religion, they will be so impressed by how you perform, how you handle things, how you conduct yourself, how good of a person you've been to them that they will automatically transfer that feeling over to whatever your religion or spirituality is. So I would say to this person, I wouldn't worry about it. Just go inward, go inside, and find a way to make sure that you demonstrate your spirituality by the good mannerisms and the way of civilized behavior that you conduct yourself. Because all religion has a way of life that is better, I think, for society. And so you can show that. Um, let me say this also, if you have a business, okay? Um, obviously, if you're a black person, people like to say, oh, it's a black business. If you're a black Muslim, people say, oh, black Muslim business. I wouldn't shy away from that. I, I encourage us and say, look, don't worry about customers that you don't yet have. I have people who write me that say, mm, I don't know if I wanna be listed in the Black Muslim Business Directory, or do I wanna put one of those signs in front of my business that says black owned business because I don't really want nobody to know I'm black. Do you have a bunch of white customers? A lot of times these people don't. Why are you worried about customers you don't even have? There's enough money in our community that in the event that, that those are the only people that shop with you, guess what? You'll be fine. You'll be more than fine. You can, you can make money and you can become very wealthy with black customers, with black Muslim cult customers. And guess what? We run the culture. See, this is what we forget. We are cultural icons. We are cultural trendsetters. We are cultural game changers. And what we do, how we vibe, how we roll, I guarantee you it's somebody outside of our culture right now looking at what I got on, got on going, where she get that from? Let me copy that. Let me take that. And they do the same thing to you. So don't be afraid of your culture and don't be afraid of who you are because who you are is how the world evolves. Pop culture would be nothing without the culture of black people. And that culture, sometimes we reject it. Let me tell you why we reject it a lot of times. We reject it because, see, out of our pain, we create we, we create a way of doing business, we paint, we um, conduct ourselves a certain way. Our style, our vibe, our swag is a product of our struggle and our pain. And so sometimes when we see our culture, it's a reminder of how much pain we've been through. And so we don't take pride. We wanna separate from that pain as much as possible. And we wanna go over here on the other side and hope that we can survive and forget about that pain. And what I'm saying to you is you also have to understand the purpose of struggle and contrast and pain. And it's, it's God making us in to the people that he wants us to be. So at the end of the day, don't be afraid of your culture. Don't allow that to trigger you and irritate you so that you think that you'll be better if you just float off into somebody else's culture and act like you ain't the spook that sat by the door. <laughs> that, that won't work, trust me, <laughs> it won't work. Um, okay, so here's number two. This person said, how do I introduce my kids, we say children in the nation, but how do I introduce my kids into business? I'm concerned about the images that they see of black men. This is, this is very interesting. And you all have heard me talk about this on more than one occasion. Uh, let me start here. Um, there's this notion of 
work-life balance that is born out of the broader community mindset. So if you are a part of a community, if you're a white person, and there are positive images of, of you, and this, is, this goes back to the Industrial Revolution almost, but there always were positive images of, black, of white people. And so white people didn't necessarily have to bring their children to work or involve their children in what they were doing because if they were at home watching television all day, they were gonna see positive images of themselves. But you see, if we leave our children at home all day to watch television while we go to work, while we go to our business, while we go do whatever it is that we do, 90% of the time, they're gonna run into negative images of themselves. You're gonna lose them mentally because they're not going to have any respect for you because they're not feeding on anything that makes them have respect for you. So the, the key thing that, that I found is important is that we have to show our young people and our children our by example. So they got to roll with us. And I'm not saying you got to take them with you every single time, but they got to be a part of your business. They got to understand what you do. They got to hear about what it is that you do. We have to stop doing one thing and expecting our children to turn out another way. It's like people who say, you know, I stayed in that situation for the children. You think the children can't see that you're not happy? Don't you know that you're programming your child to accept less than and to think that that's okay? When you step up and make a tough decision, whether it's to change jobs or get out of a relationship that's not serving you, whatever you need to do, don't you know that that's a teachable moment for your children to understand that it's important for them to choose themselves as opposed to thinking that suffering is okay, abuse is okay, um, negativity is okay. Because that's what we teach them when we hide them from the truth. And the way I grew up, we weren't, we weren't hidden from the truth. Our parents talked about it. if it was gossip, he say, she say, they made those teachable moments and taught that, taught us that. So we didn't grow up thinking that negativity or, or what was bad was okay. We grew up believing and, and thinking that relationships are supposed to serve us, help us get to that next level in our life. Our jobs are, are supposed to help us become better people. These are all things that we demonstrate to our children by living the life that we want them to live. But what happens is we make all these sacrifices and we think that our children aren't looking. We think they ain't paying no attention. But if you think back to when you was their age, you know everything and you see everything. I remember being four years old and my mother was spelling something that she didn't want me to understand. And I was looking at her like, why is she spelling? Because I knew what she was spelling. You see everything as a child. See, as a child, you're clearer. You're more open. You're more aware. And you can see. But if, if you program your child that suffering or being in a bad situation or doing what you want on a long-term basis is okay, you're really setting them up to be a doormat for somebody. And that's not good. So bring your children to work. This person said, how do I introduce my kids or children into my business? How do you do that? You talk to them about it. There's little things that maybe they can do, they can help you do. I remember my father got a couple thousand dollars from breeding a horse. And when he sat it on the table, he said, he said, Winnie, count that. Count that, Winnie. And so I counted it. And that, that just made me a part of it. And so he talked to us about it. My brother and I were talking the other day about how we would spend hours looking at quarter horse journals 
just talking about the type of horse that maybe he should breed to this horse or that he should buy. But that, that got us involved. And that's important. So it might be something small, like holding a camera for you while you're videotaping yourself, walking into your business. Something small, like maybe helping you to straighten up an office. Maybe something small by letting them sit in on a video call that you have. Maybe you're interviewing an employee. Maybe your teenager or your preteen child can sit in. They can be on the other side of the camera and they can listen. And when you get off that call, they can learn. And you all can have a conversation. What did you learn from that? What do you think? Because you start the wheels of their mind to turning. If you're a mechanic, you can take them to the shop. Take them there with you. And if my, when my nephews are around me, we, we, if I got business stuff to do, they go as well. They, sometimes they want to go because they, you know, they get to hang with auntie. So these are the things that we have to do. We have to involve our children. We have to understand people that we are at war. We are at war for our minds and we are at war against a system that doesn't give us enough resources. The chances of your child learning business at school or learning accurate history about you at school is slim to none. But if you teach them, if you show them what healthy relationships look like, if you show them what it means to make tough decisions, See, sometimes we don't, we've not seen that muscle exercise. And what, do I, what muscle am I talking about? I'm talking about the muscle that makes tough decisions. See, when you're in business, you got to make hard decisions. You got to make hard decisions about employees. You got to make hard decisions about who you are. You got to make ultimately hard decisions about your relationships that you're in. Why? Because that relationship needs to be able to serve you, help you get to that next level. Because we can't afford to be a status quo. So show your children what it means to make tough decisions. Let them see it. Because they're going to have to make tough decisions in a very short period of time. Probably when they get in high school or college, there's going to be something that they're going to come up against where they have to make a tough decision and you don't want them to run over in the corner and hide and be afraid to make that tough decision, but that's what they're gonna do if you haven't showed them what it means to make a tough decision and to own your choices. But if they see mom, dad, auntie, uncle, the people in leadership around them making the tough decision, performing the critical thinking and the analysis choosing something that will serve them. If they see that, then when they get in a situation, while it might seem small to us, something that happens to them in high school or in college, they'll be okay to make that tough decision because they've seen that muscle exercise. But to think that we're not, we're going to shelter them and have them turn out a certain way, um, you better be right there explaining to your children how to handle certain things. You better be telling them how somebody's going to talk to them about doing drugs and um, somebody's going to talk to them about what they should be in life. See, the reason why these people outside of us have more influence over us than our children is because we don't talk to them about how to analyze anything. Why are you still on this job? Well, sweetie, I'm still on this job because I have you all. These are the decisions I have to make. I, be I believe it or not, the children will probably say, Mom, quit that job. Go get another job because we want to see you happy. I have a friend of mine who just made a decision, um, unfortunately, to divorce her husband. And so she was so worried about telling her 15-year-old daughter about it. And when she, we, she and I talked about it, when she sat down, at the kitchen table and told her daughter about it, her daughter was like, Mom, I'm proud of you. I'm so glad that you chose yourself. And she just broke down crying because here she was trying to hide something from this 15-year-old who had seen her be unhappy 
See, because when you, look, look, listen, and I told her this. I said, when you love somebody, you want to see them happy. You want to see somebody with them that makes them happy. And so her daughter said, mom, I know you're not happy. I know daddy doesn't make you happy. So I'll be okay. I'll be all right. And at the end of the day, I get two houses. I got two bedrooms, I got two this or that. But that was the, the spirit in which her daughter came to her. And I told her, I said, you know what you did to your, for your daughter just by having that conversation? Because see, one day she's going to run into a situation where she has to make a decision that's tough where she may have to learn to walk away from somebody that she loves. Maybe it's a best friend who could potentially get her in trouble. She has to be able to say, I love you, but this isn't working. And so when she, um, when she did that, I, I told her, I said, that's amazing. All right, so here's the third question. And I want you all to start formulating your questions because I'm gonna go through this third question and then I'll take questions from you all here about your business um, <clears throat> this number three says, I am looking to scale my business, but it seems that when I have opened another location, I'm busy running back and forth. So, um, what I would say to this person is that we would probably need to talk about what systems and processes you have in the business first and foremost, so that things kind of run on automatic pilot. There's a reason why no matter what McDonald's you go to, no matter where it is, except in some foreign countries, uh, no matter what Burger King you go to, the food's the same, they all kind of look alike, the way they, the way they handle things are, is the same, the uniforms are the same because there's a system and there's a process that they follow so that when they scale, they can kind of plug somebody in and instead of worrying about that person kind of making up their own thing, the standards and the systems and the processes that are set become the metrics by which they're able to judge or grade or determine the effectiveness of the manager that they bring in. So we have to make sure that before you say, I want to open up three or four locations, that you got your system in, in place and that when you're interviewing you can interview with the understanding that what you really need is somebody who's going to follow this existing system, not necessarily somebody who's going to go to your next location and freestyle. Then you can get that consistency and it may keep you from running back and forth. Reason why you might also be running back and forth is because maybe you don't have the personnel. And that's a tough thing nowadays because everybody's quitting their jobs. People are not um, staying in one situation. Um, I don't know how folks are making it, but you know, a lot of places are saying, look, we're having problems. People aren't responding to ads. People aren't, um, people aren't working. People don't wanna work. Um, and for whatever that reason that is, I, I'm not sure how they're paying their bills or taking care of themselves. Some people say it's unemployment. I don't know if unemployment is that much money that you can pay all your bills off of it. Um, but I would encourage you that if you are quitting your job, that you have a way in which you make money, whether you're making money off the internet or you're drop shipping or selling stuff online, there's things that you can do from home. And there's companies that are looking for people who, who work from home. But then there's also um, businesses, smaller businesses and that can become bigger businesses that you can do from home. So if, if it's a personnel issue, um, first of all, you have to make sure that you are bringing in the right person. Look for the right personality. So you should be doing behavioral interviewing. You should be writing behavioral based employment ads. When you put your ad out there, whether it's on Indeed or however you're advertising. Um, so you should use behavior base to do that. Um, when people come into your company, you want to set up a system. You know, if you, and again, bringing up McDonald's, they so cold that on the cash register, they just got pictures of the product. 
hamburger, <laughs> pickle is a picture of a pickle. You just need to identify the picture. It's like large, small. They put a picture of a small fry and a large fry. So you don't, that system is so cold that you don't even have to think. Um, as an owner of a Massage Envy franchise, um, what I learned is that those systems are important and they map that thing down to the type of music that we had to use um, when we're on hold. You can't just play your own music, your own hold music. Um, I remember when we were putting the lobby together, they even make sure you use certain vendors. They have to approve your general contractor. Um, things like ceiling tiles and floor tiles, you have to use one of their vendors and all the products have to be standard. They have to pre-approve the design of your store um, so that they all look similar. There are certain things that go in the backdrop. All the counters have to be the same. I remember um, <laughs> we were putting together the lobby and I remember, so this is my mindset, right? Um, when I was taking this master's level course, um, I designed a medical spa called, um, I think it was called Sajna Wellness or something like that back then. And um, I put that together. And so I thought of, my concept was this really swanky wellness center connected to a boutique hotel that I would own. And people would, I would get customers from the hotel, but then also walk in customers and, and we would do a number of different, perform a number of different spa services that supported um, people taking care of themselves and taking care of their body. Because personal maintenance is very important. You know, you have to do things like stretch and you have to do things like use the right skincare and get your hair done. This is all part of what we do as civilized people, right? Um, and in order to attract people to us. Um, so anyway, um, so my mind was kind of bifurcated at the time. And so I thought, ooh, maybe I get to be myself in the lobby because they had dictated everything. The pre-orders, the products, you can't bring in any additional products. The lighting has to be approved, um, every single thing. And um, the only thing that they don't dictate is the break room, which we were able to put a little little extra stank on that. <laughs> and that's it. But I thought, they might not say nothing about the lobby. That's what I thought. And so the, maybe like uh, a week before corporate came to approve the store so that we could get open, I had this um, beautiful white couch that I used to have in my office in Chicago. And I took it with me to Maryland and um, I put that in the lobby. And um, I was so, um, just I just loved the way it looked. And, if, and before they come out, you have to send pictures because they don't want to make a trip out to your store without being certain that you're going to be set up in the right way. So I took the picture and they was like, girl, we don't get that white couch out of here. We don't see nothing in our documentation that approves of you having a white couch in the lobby. So even though it was cute, even though it was beautiful, they were sticklers about their system, their process, even down to, you know, the, the cash registers, the accounting system, everything. And I learned a lot from that. I learned about scalability and how important that is. And there were some things that, that I had to kind of argue to get a um, kind of like a set aside, like to kind of deviate just for some reason, but everything from pricing, everything. So you want to make sure that you begin to set that up in your business before you open another one. There has to be certain things. If you don't want them all to look alike, you might decide, like I'm very artistic, so I don't know that I will want all my stores to per se look alike, but there would have to be some signature things or signature items in the store, um, even down to how we greet the customer that lets the customers know oh, I'm inside of a brand that I can trust and that I've trusted and experienced before. So that's going to help you um, scale. And then, um, you know, you start the tough task of looking for somebody to run that business for you. And then you don't necessarily have to run back and forth. You can be a little bit more organized in your schedule. Maybe you spend a couple days a week at each store. 
Maybe you get to the point where you don't have to go to either store at all. You just check in on them. Um, but but that would be that would be my strong suggestion is personnel. But before you bring in the personnel, make sure you standardize your systems and processes so that they can be duplicated at the new location. Okay, and then um, and then there's a whole lot of other stuff. But that that would be my basics of what I would say. Um, anybody else? Any other questions? Because I don't want to sit here and ramble. Because y'all know I can. Um, but if you have any other questions about your business or um, what you're thinking, uh, welcome Sean Mac 1097. Welcome Nate Boogie 11. Um, Real Time T. Welcome, welcome. Nubia Flow says, Sister Sajda, how did you begin explaining what you did as an entrepreneur without feeling like you have to explain yourself to folks? Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, that's that's an internal work because I have people to, to to this day who say to me like I don't even know what you do I don't even understand what you do and I give them a little cliff note but what I would suggest that you do create a little elevator pitch something that's just a couple sentences that explains what it is that you do you don't have to go into a whole long story you don't have to define who you are but create a quick pitch. And you want that quick pitch anyway. They call it an elevator pitch because if you're in a big building and you are standing next to uh, Kevin Hart, who's been on Shark Tank, who's looking for black businesses to invest in, you want to be able to rattle that business off real quick because you might only have five or ten seconds to have that conversation with him. So I would say create that little elevator pitch. And then that's it. The rest of it, you start to fill out because you're going to evolve. That's the beautiful thing about being an entrepreneur. Who you are today is not going to be who, who you will be um, tomorrow. So those are, um, I, I would say, the elevator pitch. Make a quick elevator pitch. You should be able to say who you are. Boom, real quick. You notice at the beginning of my radio shows, I give a quick pitch on who I am. And it's the same all the time. Sometimes I throw in a few other things. And then that pitch is not based on what I want people, um, what I care about people think of me. It's based on um, what it is that I do. And it's really a sales pitch. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Real Time T says, what's the best route to obtaining a true mentor? Um, that's a tough question because companies they have these things called mentorship programs and all that stuff. And they're really, um, Asante, they're really BS <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, the, the internet um, is good about now allowing you to be able to create virtual mentors. There are people you can follow, you know, like myself and other people who can help you get some direction but the question is, do you want a mentor or do you want a consultant or do you want a coach? So I think you have to figure out which one it is that you need. If you want a mentor, somebody who kind of just gives you advice and, and, and leads by example, you can, if you can't find them around you, you can get them virtually. You can just follow certain people, see what they do, how they do what they do, and think through some of the psychological things that they must be going through to make those decisions. Then, but you could say, coach. Are you looking for a coach? Do you have specific things that you want to talk to somebody about so that they can push, push you to that next level? Because as a coach, that's what I do. I push people. I say, look, by next week, I need you to have done X, Y, Z. Or are you looking for a consultant? Like, do you have an existing business that you need somebody to come in and analyze and consult you on and give you some results-oriented answers to a problem? Like maybe why you haven't grown an income, what's going on? Um, so I think you got to distinguish, because some people say they need a mentor, but it could be a coach, could be a consultant, or it could be a mentor. So when we talking about a coach, let me tell you how to pick a coach or a consultant. Um, and I see the other question, do I, do I do business consultation? 
Yes, I do. That's what I do for a living. I spend most of my life as a business consultant. So I've been in and out of many, many, many Fortune 500 companies. Um, that's my love. That is my passion is to do business consulting and to help you get to that next level. So I'm that person that a lot of businesses will call in to help solve a problem and to analyze um, what's going on. If you want money, if you want coaching, um, thank you, Brother Car Juan Carlos. He just put up the link tree. You can book a coaching session with me. So you can go right there to the link in my bio and book a coaching session and we can have a coaching conversation. It'll say money psychology coaching, but really it's everything's all connected, right? Life, love, business, health, uh, money. And so we'll talk in general about how to coach you through what it is that, that you need work on. So that's how you can get me as a coach. Now, as a business consultant, yes, you can send me an email, uh, mindofanentrepreneurtoday at gmail.com. I'm happy to come in, analyze your business, give you some ideas on systems, on processes, on the people, on the product, whatever it is that you need. And I have a wealth of experience at doing that. Um, and, and let me just say this to you. I remember years ago, I was doing a program with a sister and she didn't really have a background in business. She had a background in business on a part-time basis. And I would, and then, I, when I started saying that I was doing, that I was a business consultant, she started saying, well, yeah, I'm a consultant, I'm a coach too. But let me say this. If you don't understand what it means to eat what you kill, I would not choose that person as a, as a coach or a consultant. Choose somebody that has a resume. You can go on LinkedIn, put my name in, and you will see the amount of projects that I've had, and I don't even have them all listed but they range in a number of different industries, um, well up over um, $500 million worth of projects where I work for other people, some millions that I've done for myself, but tons of projects. Um, and this is, this is what I did for a living. I spent years on the road around the world, primarily in the United States from Chicago to the East Coast, consulting in businesses. And... Um, or consulting businesses. So I think that's important because people will say to you, well, hire me as a business coach, hire me as a consultant. You need to be doing your research before you pay your money. Don't, don't sit down unless they can tell you, yep, I built this business. I, um, I put this system together. Um, I've done this amount of coaching and consulting. Um, I have this amount of experience. Because in this particular case, this person I was working with, she didn't have a lot of that experience. The only experience she had was on a part-time basis. But guess what? You're going to be limited. That person's going to be limited in how they can help you. And that's like things that I don't know anything about. I don't try to do anything with. But a lot of people hear the buzzwords out here and they say, oh, I'm going to be a coach. Oh, I'm going to be a business consultant. When really they have no idea what they're doing. So... Pick somebody, and I'm going to just say it straight, like myself, who has spent years invested in the industry. you got to have a muscle for business consulting. That muscle comes from co going in and out of different environments and exercising against the contrast that exists in those environments. That's what's important because you can't just say, I'm a business consultant and you don't know what it's like. See, as a consultant... Sometimes you go into places and people want you there. Sometimes they don't want you there. Sometimes it's a merger. Sometimes it's an acquisition. Sometimes you come in to dismantle the company, but you can't tell anybody. They tell you, look, we close it. So we need you to come in and figure out how to help us dismantle this and maintain as much money for the stakeholders, but get rid of these people. People get wind of that. They don't want to be bothered with you. So you have to use certain skills how to get the information you need. You have to know how to analyze the systems and figure out how to either improve them or dismantle them or merge them with another system. Sometimes you have, you have to do system conversions. Sometimes you have to come in. I had a project one time where the controller ended up being on drugs. And 
They said, we just want you to come in and sit in on the financial meetings and advise us. So those are, those are the types of things that a consultant does. And then when you move over to coaching, not everybody is a good coach because some people don't like other people. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm the kind of person I like people. <laughs> and I like working with people and I like seeing people successful. So when I put together coaching, I'm going to teach you and I'm not afraid to show you my life and say, this is what I've done and this is how I overcame that. This is how I got there. Okay. Um, a lot of coaches don't want to do that. They just want you to talk and then they have a bullet point list of things that they're going to tell you. When you do coaching with me, it is customized to you. It's not based on a, a, a system that I'm just going to shove down your throat that might not be good for you. I'm not trying to tie you into a cult, if you will, or a cult-like thinking. What I'm saying is coaching should liberate you. If you get coached by me, it is designed to liberate you. So when you click that link in the bio and you say, hey, I want a couple sessions with Sister Saja, you may say, you know what? I only need a couple sessions now. The idea is that maybe a couple months from now, you come back and say, let me get a little tweaking. Let me come back and get a little bit more. But that's the idea behind coaching. But somebody who wants to lock you in on a long-term basis and not allow you to be independent is not necessarily a good coach. So that's how you choose a coach. Those are the different initiatives. Um, Sister Aletha, some alaikum. She said, thank you, Sister Saja, for breaking that down. There is a great imposter syndrome within the world of social media. We must examine their true experience. Thank you. That's exactly right. So many imposters. Everybody's a consultant. Everybody's a coach. A consultant needs to have had experience that you can draw strength from and knowledge from. Same thing with a coach. A coach needs to be able, think about a coach from an athletic standpoint. You want that coach to be able to tell you what you need to do. If you play tennis and you say, no matter what I do, when I hit my forehand, it keeps going into the net. Well, you want that coach to be able to evaluate your stance, your swing, look at the weight of your racket, how you turn in your elbow, are you bending your knees enough? Um, are you putting top spin on it? What are you doing? You want that coach to be able to be knowledgeable enough to be able to look at you and your performance and tell you what you need to improve and give you some additional techniques. You don't need nobody just bumping their gums in front of you. So that, that's how that go. Um, repeat the email again, um, please. Mind of an entrepreneur today at gmail.com. That's if you want business consulting. If you want individual one-on-one -on -one coaching, you just click the link in the bio, go to where it says money psychology coaching and, and book a session um, and then go from there. But if you want consulting, then what I'll have you do is you send me an email, give me a summary of your business and what you're looking for. I'll send you, I'll assess how much time. First, I'll assess if it's something that I've, I feel like I can do. Um, and if it is, um, then what we'll do is we'll put together a schedule, we'll put together a scope of services, and then we'll put together um, a price um, because I want to be results oriented. All right. Any other questions? This is our Mo Today um, Conscious Entrepreneur Q&A session. Um, this is my favorite stuff. I love answering questions and giving you real-time support and advice. Um, Material Girls World says, thank you. That's what I need. All praises due to Allah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sister Aletha says, right, right, right. <laughs> um, any other questions? Anything else? Make sure y'all go get your commemorative Elijah coin pendant. Y'all like this? I love this. Just the idea to be able to have a piece of the lamb's house that I can wear on my neck. What? <laughs> To hold it in my hand, this came from the lamb's house. I'm sitting here looking at a table of artifacts and things that um, we've uh, had to replace or taken from the house. Um, I even have one of the one of the bricks right here. Look at this big solid brick. This is not an old school, a new school brick with the holes in it. 
This is a old, this brick is two, no, 120 years old. 120 years old. And so is this copper. We just melted it and processed it and cleaned it off um, so that you can wear it nicely um, as a necklace. Who don't want this? Who don't want this? Um, somebody said, Real Time says, okay, there are many sources of business plans. What do you recommend? Um, yeah, there's a lot of sources of business plans. I think you can you can literally almost pick any one. You just want to make sure that it touches on all the components of business. You want to make sure that it includes a budget, that it includes um, strategy, scope of services, that you des design your product out and describe your product or service out. You want to be able to do projections. You want to be able to analyze your target audience. You want to be able to analyze your location that you're in. Should it be brick and mortar? Should it be um, uh, virtual? Those are all the components that you want in the business plan. And let me tell you why a business plan is important. Because the business plan is kind of like that Bible you can refer back to when you start to feel some kind of way. Because you're going you know, to go through struggles. It's going to be tough. But you want to be able to refer back in writing to where you've reduced your mind to writing so that you can make it happen. But those are the components. Within the business components, you want to look at marketing. You want to look at accounting and budgeting. You want to look at the legal aspects. What's in the name? Should it be trademark? Should it be copyright? Do you need a patent? Can you move forward if you're patent pending? You want to be able to look at all those components in your business plan. What's the strategy? What's your mission? Who are your stakeholders? What are your goals? What's important to you? What kind of image do you want to give off? How should people feel when they come into your business? What is the experience that you're selling? See, I teach my clients to sell an experience. So if you're a financial consultant like Sister Aletha, she's selling an experience. She's not selling you money products. She's selling you experiences. Because what she's saying is when you come and experience me, this is what you get. And this is how you will feel when you leave your session with me. So you're selling an experience. If I walk into your store, I'm walking into an experience. I don't care what your store look like, whether you intended it to be or not, I'm walking into an experience. When you mail me something, you send me something. You're sending me an experience. When I'm talking to you about these commemorative Elijah pendants, this product is an experience. And people will spend their money on an experience. When people have limited discretionary income, they will likely choose to spend their money on the product or service where they get the best experience as opposed to not. That's why people buy Gucci and Louis Vuitton because it's the experience of it. It's the experience of wearing a Gucci outfit or carrying a Louis Vuitton purse. It's the experience, the reaction, the interaction. When you go into the store, how does it look? What's the packaging like? How is it when you open it up? That's all part of the experience. And so I encourage people that if people don't give you a good experience, in other words, if they disrespect you, there was so much time, so so long where a lot of us were complaining about um, like beauty supply stores. How we, I remember there was that girl in LA who lost her life due, from an owner of a beauty supply store. And I was teaching my clients, I said, don't go in there. If, if somebody cannot respect you, you don't follow your money behind disrespect. If I walk into a store and you act disrespectful or you got a problem with me, I will leave that shit right there. Let you put it back. Because I'm not going to I'm not going to attach the emotion of the money that I have and I spend to something negative. I'm just not going to do it. So so what we have to do is say, "All right. What is the experience of doing business with our people?" Well, we may not have all the packaging and the bells and whistles, but the idea is supporting our community, supporting black, black owned, black Muslim owned, 
is important as an experience for us. So if that means I got to drive extra and get off an extra F exit a little further than I normally would go just to go black on, I'll do that. If that means that I got to jump through a few extra hoops to do business, hopefully you're working to make my business easy, make me do business with you easy, more easily, but I might, gotta, I might have to do a little bit. And let me say this lastly, people. Um, if there's, we may have time for one more question. Um, we got like 10 minutes. Let me say this. When people are buying from you, make it easy for them to pay you. I cannot stand if I try to support a black entrepreneur and they say, in order for them to sell me the product, I got to get in my car. I got to go to their bank. I got to stand in line. I got to make a deposit into their account. Um, just if there's a lot of difficulties, find ways. Make that a part of your business plan to, to make it easy for somebody to pay you. It should, there's so much technology out here today. It's just as easy as you standing there with your phone and you can take their credit card right there or they can cash app you or Zelle you or, or whatever, but there's a lot of technology and you can say, here's your product, here's your service, and you can spend more time giving them that experience than having them run around and jump through hoops just to pay you. And then you got an attitude because they don't pay you. It's like, because I ain't got time to drive 10 miles to your bank and deposit into your bank account after standing in line for 20 minutes. So you're going to get it when I, <laughs> you're going to get it when I can get to going through all that. Find an easy way. Find an easy way to make, um, allow somebody to pay you. All right. Okay. So if there's no more questions, couple reminders. Tomorrow night, thank you. Let me know if you all like these Q&A sessions and we'll do more of them. And um, But tomorrow night is part three of the Mo Today Manifestation series. We're going to talk about learning to trust your gut. We're going to talk about how to Increase the intensity of that those gangliotic nerves that exist between our rib cage and our belly button that tell us everything. It has a mind. It is considered the sun of the body. And so we're going to dissect that. Um, she said, I have been sitting on businesses for too long that I'm ready now to execute. All praise is due to Allah. We have to, we have to right? Jobs aren't as plentiful as they used to be. Um, if they are, conditions aren't always what we want them. It's just time. It's time for us to get up and do something for ourselves. It's time for us to own and monetize ourselves. All right, so I'll see you all tomorrow night, inshallah, 7 p.m. Central Time. It's going to be on the Sajda Wendy Muhammad YouTube channel, the Manifestation Series. Make sure you join because this is mental warfare. And I want to help give us tools so that we can open up and do something for ourselves. So with that, again, if you want to book a one-on-one -on -one coaching session, go to the link in the bio. Click on um, Money Psychology Coaching and you can book a session. If you want me for consulting, send me an email, mindofanentrepreneurtoday at gmail.com and we'll go from there. All right. Peace and blessings, family, and inshallah, I'll see you all tomorrow evening.